Hi, and welcome to What's the Scoop on Loop workshop hosted by King Conservation District and King County Wastewater Treatment Division. My name is Clyde, and I am one of the presenters today. I am the Community Agriculture Program Coordinator at KCD, and I support community gardens all over King County with technical assistance, um, education, and free resources. Hi, I'm Ashley Miley with um, King County Wastewater Treatment Division, and I work on the biosolids team, uh, helping to get our loop biosolids to our customers all throughout Washington state. Um, my primary responsibility is developing new loop products and um, the programs associated with those new products, which we hope will be a compost product in the future. Hi, I'm Kat Cowan. I also work for the King County Wastewater Treatment Division on the biosolids team in resource recovery. And I, like Ashley, help King County residents add nutrients and carbon back to farms, forests, and gardens throughout Washington State. I uh, help with our agricultural projects, our forestry projects, and our compost projects. Hi, I'm Sienna Ezekiel, and I'm an educator with King County Wastewater Treatment Division. I help teach the public of all ages about the resources we recover from wastewater, including loop biosolids. And I also help run high school programs. Um, and I'll mention some education opportunities at the end of this program. We will start today with a land acknowledgement. We publicly acknowledge that we work on the unceded traditional land of the Coast Salish peoples past and present to honor their histories and practices of taking care of the land, water, and beyond. As we talk about soil in this presentation and our relationship to the earth and land, we acknowledge the displacement and erasure that took place on these soils. So I invite everyone to take a moment to acknowledge the land that you are on. Um, if you know the tribal land that you reside on, please share. And um, if you're not sure, there's a great website uh, to find out. It is uh, nativeland.ca. Um, and this is a map called the Water Lines Project Map. And this is what the Puget Sound area would have looked like uh, pre-contact. And um, you can read more about it on the BerkMuseum.org website. Um, but yeah, we would just like to start off this presentation with this um, information. All right, excellent. Thanks, Clay. So we want to start today thinking about these two questions. So we want you to take a moment and think about how you perceive soil. And additionally, what does soil mean to you? Okay, so now that you've all had a chance to think about soil a little bit, let's talk about what soil is. And soil is actually very complicated. It's made up of three parts. There are mineral components, so that's the rocks uh, that are broken down over time. There's pore space. So that's all the pockets for air and water to move through. And then there's a small amount of something called organic matter. In Western Washington, soil is about two to 10% organic matter. And organic matter is the part of soil that's made up of plant and animal parts in various stages of breakdown or decomposition. Uh, that sounds a little gross, but organic matter is critically important to soil health. It's full of billions of microorganisms animals and fungi all working together to break down those dead and decomposing things. And organic matter helps soil retain water, uh, hold on to nutrients over time, and it also provides food and housing for all of the critters and plants that are living in the soil. The process of creating soil is excruciatingly slow. It takes about a thousand years to make even an inch of soil, but Soil is a dynamic and living thing. So what's dirt? Uh, it's soil without structure or organic matter. So it's essentially crumbled up rocks that cannot support life. All right, so what does soil need to be healthy? Soil needs that organic matter. It needs good micro and macro organisms. So your 
your little microorganisms all the way up to earthworms and moles and birds and, and all of the things that, that live in our environment. And it needs cover, it needs plants to be healthy. And it also needs to be treated with care. So as I said before, it takes a thousand years to create an inch of soil. So it's actually something very precious and potentially fragile. So for instance, in our area, we get a lot of rain in the winter. And when soil is very wet, it's actually susceptible to something called compaction, which is where if you tromp all over it or you drive on it, uh, it squishes out all of that pore space. And then you can't get air or water into it. And it's bad for roots. It's bad for the animals living in it. So you don't want to tromp all over your garden beds when it's super wet outside. Alternatively, when it's extremely dry and there's no moisture in your soil, your, the structure of your soil is also susceptible to breaking down and losing that pore space and becoming dirt. So I want you all to think about a little bit how you care for your soil right now. If you do, no judgment if you don't, I'm not a great gardener. Uh, and then think about what you add to your soil. And then Cly is gonna tell us a little bit about the history of, of fertilizers. All right, uh, so let's talk about fertilizers. Uh, before I begin, I would just like to quickly define what a fertilizer is, because we may come from different levels of experience in gardening. Uh, fertilizer is basically a chemical or natural substance added to soil or land to increase its fertility. Um, but I also was curious about like, how did how did people back then know to use fertilizer? Um, researchers speculate that people who had animals nearby their crops must have noticed that the crops that had animal poop enhanced crop growth compared to crops that didn't. Um, so evidence shows that early farmers were using manure to fertilize their crops as long as 8,000 years ago. And this is a sample of barley and wheat from a farming site. Um, and they have levels, high levels of nitrogen consistent uh, with being fertilized by manure. Um, in China, Japan, Egypt, Rome, and, and early Germany all have records of using minerals or manure uh, to increase their yields uh, on their farms. So human waste became a popular manure um, in Asia and Europe, and we will cover that later on. Um, so yeah. And I also wanted to mention guano. Uh, guano or seabird or bat poop um, has been used in the Andes for 1,500 years by uh, the indigenous peoples of Peru. And um, it became really popular in the 1840s. Um, so much that Europe and the US pretty much took advantage of this resource and expanded the whole guano trade. Um, it became so popular in this era that tens of thousands of tons of bird poop were being imported to the US every year. Um, unfortunately, this expansion relied heavily on um, abusive labor system on uh, Chinese workers and locals. Um, and then in 1856, Congress passed the Guano's Island Act, uh, which let US companies claim any island that had guano in the Pacific and Caribbean Ocean. So if you found bird poop on an island, you were able to claim it. Um, but I, I just think that it's a very interesting case where um, our U.S. history of imperialism and intersected with agriculture. Um, so I recommend Googling it and reading more about it because it's super interesting. And as we just mentioned, guano caused some serious social problems um, and fertilizer can itself can be pretty dangerous. Um, if you over fertilize, that can cause um, some problems like plant burnout, um, no fruits. Um, there's environmental problems like fertilizers in our water streams. Um, but yeah, I think that uh, the more you learn about it, um, the, the better you are uh, figuring out which kinds of compost or fertilizers um, is best for you. 
and yeah, growing up, um, my grandpa and my mom would always use eggshells as fertilizer. Uh, my mom also uh, soaks banana peels in water and then uses that to water her plants. Um, but I would like to ask you all, what kinds of fertilizers have you used? Um, there's liquid seaweed, fish, blood, bone. <laughs> so there's many examples. And then we want to share this video um, from the soil story with Pashan Murray, which is a great way to um, just connect the dots of um, the individual actions of gardening and using compost to um, a larger scale like the earth and, and how it affects uh, its climate. My name is Passion Murray, and I make compost in the city of Detroit. I want to share with you a story about soil, farming, and compost, and how it can be a solution for climate change. Climate change is a big problem. It's happening because there's too much carbon in our atmosphere, but carbon is not our enemy. It's the building block of life. Everything alive is made of it. It's us. The problem and the solution are a simple matter of balance. Let's step back and look at the five pools where carbon is stored on planet Earth. Starting about 500 million years ago, when plants came onto land, carbon began to cycle in an amazing balance, a balance that allowed for life as we know it to evolve. Then one life form, us, figured out how to extract carbon from the fossil pool. We've been burning it for energy, putting it into play and disrupting that balance. How we manage land and do agriculture is moving even more carbon from the soil and biosphere into the atmosphere. Specifically, we've moved 880 gigatons of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, which is heating up the planet and destabilizing our climate. Now, the oceans have absorbed a lot of this excess carbon, which is resulting in warming temperatures, acidification, and accelerating a mass extinction of sea life. In order to stop global warming, of course we have to stop burning fossil carbon. The big question is, where do we put the excess carbon to get the cycle back in balance? Remember when I said that soil was a part of the solution? It literally is. Plants, with sunlight and water, perform photosynthesis. They pull carbon in from the air and turn it into carbohydrates, sugars. Then they pump some of those sugars down through their roots to feed microorganisms who use that carbon to build soil. There we go, carbon move. The plants pull it in and the soil stores it. Nature's living technology is amazing. Scientists have recently discovered that applying a thin layer of compost one time sets up an ongoing positive feedback loop that brings more and more carbon into the soil each year. In concert with our regenerative practices like not tilling the soil, planting trees and cover crops, and good grazing, we can build and retain gigatons of soil carbon. This is carbon farming. This is regenerative agriculture. More carbon in the ground is good for us. It makes healthy soil. Healthy soil makes for more nutritious food, and it holds way more water so crops are more resilient in the face of drought. That's good news for families, farmers like me, and everyone that eats. The way we grow our food, fuel, and even our clothes either puts carbon into the atmosphere or pulls it down into the ground. The regeneration of soil is the task of our generation. Our health, the health of the soil, and the health of the planet are one and the same. So all kinds of human poop and all kinds of poop from lots of different sources has been used to build healthy soil for as long as humans have been growing food. So we wanted to ask you what kind of poop have you used in your own garden? Some examples include, you know, your, your own poop, human, human waste, chicken manure, cow steer manure, horse manure, pig manure, fish fertilizer, compost, bat guano, zoodoo, uh, worm castings, the list really goes on. So take a minute and think about what kinds of um, organic poop-based things you've used in your own garden. 
All right, let's delve into night soil. So night soil is a Victorian euphemism for human poop. Uh, the Loop Biosolids program is not, by any stretch of the imagination, the first example of using poop as a soil amendment. Uh, in fact, societies all over the world have been using human poop to grow plants for centuries, uh, as we have been discussing periodically throughout this talk. So in East Asian countries, night soil was highly prized and meticulously managed. Uh, in fact, as late as the 1970s, urban toilet cleaners in uh, southern China were still paying for residential night soil. And going far, much farther back during the Aztec Empire, dating back to around 1100 AD, thousands of people worked to collect human waste from the city of Tenochtitlan to fertilize the Chinapas, uh, which were the famous floating gardens of the Aztec Empire. Uh, these floating gardens were responsible for feeding the region's estimated 250,000 inhabitants. So that was a very meticulously managed system. In Europe, the use of night soil was common, but a little bit more under the table often. In Tudor England, gong farmers, like the guy that you're seeing on uh, the left of your screen, uh, were employed to dig out and remove poop from cesspits. Uh, they could only work at night, which is probably where the idea of night soil emerged. And it was very gross and also dangerous and stigmatized work. So most of that night soil was taken out of cities and used in agriculture. But in London, in various points in their history, a lot of it was also dumped straight into the river. So that was really not ideal. And uh, you can only imagine what London smelled like at that time. Uh, in the USA and in Europe, industrialization kind of broke down the connection between human waste and soil. And the flush toilet, the invention of the flush toilet, also diluted its usefulness as a fertilizer until now. So modern night soil looks a little bit different, thankfully. Uh, in King County, we've branded our transformed night soil and we call it loop. I wanna do a quick run through of the wastewater treatment process so you know how the poop loop, as you're seeing on your screen, how that poop loop works. Uh, so when you flush your toilet uh, or take a shower or put food down your disposal, the water and the poop and the food goes to one of three regional treatment plants. At the treatment plants, those solids are separated from the liquids and transferred to large tanks called digesters. Digesters operate a lot like our stomachs. They're filled with beneficial microorganisms that break down the poop and food, they kill the pathogens, and then they transform it into a nutrient-rich soil amendment that can be used to grow crops. Uh, it looks a lot like this, and it actually shines a little bit in the sunshine because of a nutrient com compound called struvite. So if you ever have a chance to see a pile of biosolids in the sun, you will be amazed. So remember how I said organic matter was really important to soil health? Loop is over 85% organic matter. So it really is a great soil, soil grower. Um, here in King County, we truck an average of 355 tons of biosolids away from our three regional treatment plants every single day. That's the equivalent of 270 Honda Civics. It's a lot of poop. Uh, so how do we make all of that poop work for us? We send loop primarily to farms in Eastern Washington. That's, you see that 74% agriculture part on that pie chart. Uh, and in Eastern Washington, it grows wheat, sunflowers, oats, canola, uh, whatever the farmers want to grow there. Then we also use loop in Western Washington to grow Douglas fir trees. Until 2020, we were sending a small amount of loop to a private business partner to make a product called Groco. Uh, so that's, that's compost made with loop. And Ash is gonna talk a little bit more about that in a second. But we just wanna emphasize that your poop is really making a difference in Washington state. So what is Groco compost? Uh, it was produced by Sada Supply from 1976 to 2020. That was our private compost partner. And it was a three to one mix of uh, sawdust and loop biosolids. So three parts sawdust, one part loop. Uh, and it really works quite well. You can see from this picture 
the garden on the left is Groco compost and the garden on the right used organic fertilizer, just any organic fertilizer you would buy off the shelf in you know, your local hardware store, or your nursery, that kind of a product um, was used in comparison. And you can see that the sunflowers are much taller. You can see the nasturtium is much more lush. Uh, the color is greener. And so it really, really provides all the micro and macronutrients as well as the organic matter that you need to really have good healthy soil. And Groco compost was used throughout the Pacific Northwest on gardens and landscapes for more than 40 years. Um, and so why does it work so well? Like I said, it has all of those macro and micronutrients and the organic matter. Um, but there's a little bit of magic in biosolids products as well. Um, so you get this really amazing soil microbial interactions when you have healthy soil. And because biosolids have all 16 plant nutrients as well as organic matter, um, and a 1% or increase in organic matter helps hold 25,000 gallons of extra water in the soil. So that's like one swimming pool. Um, if your soil can hold more water and has all the nutrients it needs and provides a great habitat for all those beneficial microorganisms, then you get a complex food web um, with a lot of decomposition and nutrient cycling happening in the soil. And that's why you get such amazing plants when you use uh, compost products and compost products made with biosolids specifically. And so that's really nice if you're a lazy gardener, um, which I'm an avid gardener, but I'm a very lazy one. And using biosolids products allows me to not do too much to my garden, not water it too often, and have really, really beautiful plants with really beautiful flowers. So how is compost made? Kat told you a little bit about how the wastewater treatment process works and how our loop biosolids um, is made at our treatment plants here in King County. The compost process is just one additional step that happens after our loop product leaves the treatment plants. Um, so this starting at the left side is when loop leaves that wastewater treatment system and then it is mixed together with a collection of residential wood chips and yard clippings, for example. The Groco product used sawdust, but you can really use any sort of woody material. And these materials are mixed together according to, you know, whatever your compost recipe is. So it's sort of like baking a cake. Um, and the recipe is really similar to any kind of backyard compost that you might make. Think about how you're supposed to layer the browns and the greens. So in this case, the brown is the carbon source, the wood chips and the yard clippings, and the green is the biosolids, the loop product, which is the nitrogen source. And you wanna balance that carbon to nitrogen ratio to get sort of the right ratio for decomposition uh, for all those little microorganisms. And then once mixed, this pile is put over pipes that blow air to keep the pile well aerated. The similar to how you should maybe turn your compost pile in your backyard every now and then. Although I know not everyone does that. And if I were to do backyard composting, I would probably never turn my compost pile, which is why I leave it to the professionals. So when in the composting process, microorganisms break down the material into uh, using a process called aerobic composting, which is really just decomposition where microorganisms eat the material and they eat each other and they store the nutrients in their bodies and then they die. And this process gets really hot, uh, usually up to 150 to 160 degrees Fahrenheit. And that process kills any remaining pathogens. And then it moves on to the curing phase which is when different populations of microorganisms take over to sort of stabilize the material and produce a high quality compost product that anybody can use um, on your garden and on your landscape. And once the composting process is done, the compost is usually um, sometimes like a little chunky, there's like big pieces of wood in it still. And so it's put through a screen to kind of create an even texture and particle size um, for whatever compost market you are trying to sell to. So there's coarse compost and fine compost and they have different uses.
So dozens of community gardens all over King County have been using GrowCo. We've been partnered with King County um, for the past two to three years, and we've been able to give GrowCo for free to community gardens. Um, there are some community gardens that just don't have the infrastructure to build compost bins or enough compost to feed their garden. And so we're just really happy that we can provide that service um, because it's such a helpful and an amazing resource for everyone. Um, an example of a community garden is City Soil Farm, and that is a farm at the Renton treatment plant. And that's where GroCo is used to grow food um, for White Center Food Bank. Um, and then that food gets distributed into the community. People eat the food, it goes through our bodies, um, and then it somehow gets back into our wastewater treatment center and then grow co is made. So it's just a really cool example of a closed loop system um, and making all of it local. And um, another example is that King Conservation District has a native plant nursery and we use GrowCo for our native plants as well. Great. Uh, so now that you've heard a little bit more about biosolids and night soil and how, how those two things are different, I promise, um, how do you feel about using biosolids in your garden? And then alternatively, or in addition to, what have you learned that you're excited to try? So we hope that perhaps now you're excited to try um, a biosolids product and maybe maybe you're a longtime user of GrowCo compost or the city of Tacoma's Tagro products or um, another product in your local community, um, but maybe you're trying it for the first time. Uh, so for us here at King County, um, our longtime compost partner that made the GrowCo product with our loop biosolids closed in 2020. Um, and that closure was something that we anticipated and it's a huge opportunity for change here in King County. And in the future, we're exploring bringing a new retail product, um, a loop compost that King County would own and produce itself to market. And we hope to do, be able to do that by 2023. Um, takes a little bit of time to do some permitting and construction uh, here in King County. So with a county-owned compost product, we'd be able to keep more loop local. Uh, we'd be able to use it in public areas and our parks. Uh, we'd be able to distribute it to our neighbors, to community gardens, and more. And right now, this is still a dream that has some big challenges, but we're really trying to work to make it a reality. And we want to launch a small scale pilot project, uh, which will test different loop compost recipes and loop compost products that are produced at our treatment plant in Renton, Washington. And we will definitely need product testers and would love to form a collaborative community based product uh, development team. So if you'd like any more information about our future compost plans, you can contact us at loop at kingcounty.gov. Uh, that email goes to Kat and myself. So we're happy to tell you a little bit more and see how we could potentially collaborate. Um, we're hopeful that as we start to build uh, a class A biosolids program that would produce a loop compost, we'll have more opportunities for grant programs and compost donations that increase food security, access to green space and community, and build better and healthier soil to grow healthier food. Um, and also just to increase uh, acceptance of recycled products like biosolids, which really close that loop and bring you a product that you help contribute to every single day. So that's a really exciting development for us here at King County. Um, loop has been a really popular product, but a lot of you can't actually access it and only access it as GrowCo compost. And so we're really excited to develop our product line to bring a product that is available to the public here in King County. All right, and as we wrap up, um, I wanted to mention that King County Wastewater Treatment Division offers a lot of education programs that are all free. We have uh, programs for almost all ages, so we really emphasize programs for 
upper elementary students, middle school, high school students, and then adult and community programs for all ages as well. And we've been able to make a lot of these programs virtual. Um, so if you visit our website, which um, is linked at the bottom of the screen here, you can check out what we're offering. Um, and I hope that uh, later in 2021, we'll be able to open up our treatment plants to the public again so we can have more of those in person programs and tours. But for now, we have pre recorded wastewater tours. If you want to watch them, they're linked on our website and you can learn more about the process. And we have more workshops, not just in compost, but also wildfire management and caring for your streams or lakeside property. Um, so you can check out our website, kingcd.org, for, for more. And yeah, this would be um, our Q&A session, um, but we are open to answering any of your questions if you email us or um, contact us by phone. Um, we appreciate you all uh, going through this presentation with us and um, yeah, have a good day. <laughs> yeah, thank you all for your attention and watching this video. And yeah, please send any email, any questions that you have to us through email or call us. We, we're always happy to talk about poop. <laughs>